Greetings, my friends. It is I, the Great One himself, founder of the Cynical Libertarian Society, CYNLIBSOC.com. On the interwebs, you can send me email at God, that's dog spelled backwards, God, at CYNLIBSOC.com. Today is the same day that I recorded the episode of Stating the Obvious, in which I talked about Aaron Clary's post about blaming women disproportionately for the decline of Western civilization, and I talked about who should be allowed to vote, who shouldn't be allowed to vote. And by the time we got to the end of the episode, I was having a really good time with the whole move along, get out of the line, you're taking up space. You know, I, I was doing my shtick, I was having fun, which is what this is all about. So after we finished recording, Randy and I went out, had a couple of beers, and then as we were sitting there talking, I realized that, first of all, I didn't adequately explain because I've, I've learned never to assume, assuming, we know what assuming does, but I should not assume that people understand my line of reasoning, right? Part of talking about philosophy is explaining your line of reasoning in full because you cannot assume that other people know where you're coming from. So the first thing I left out of the podcast was I did not in detail explicitly explain why people who work for corporations that get bailouts and get uh, government contracts and all this other stuff shouldn't be allowed to vote. And then, of course, I realized I also forgot to mention another group of people that should not be allowed to vote. And again, you know, this is where, and this is one of the great things about doing a podcast or also writing, for those of you who are writers, and this, this is another reason why so many of you are trapped in the same worldview you've had since you were eight years old. Because you never articulate your belief system from start to finish, from conception to implementation. You never articulate it either as words or well, as words, but either as written word or as spoken word so that other people can understand it. And when you have to articulate, well, yeah, I don't have to, but when you articulate your worldviews, your belief systems, your philosophies, by either writing them down or talking about them, it allows you to see the flaws in them, which is, of course, talking about politics and philosophy and all this other stuff, is how I made the transition from left-wing statist to right-wing statist, to right-wing minarchist, to anarcho-capitalist. Because the more I talked about how, well, we, but we got to have a government to build the roads, the more I realized how incredibly fucking stupid that was. Most of you out there never... I mean, you can't develop a muscle if you don't work it. Most of you out there never develop or use your brains. You never think about philosophical issues like, well, can somebody other than the government make a flat place on the ground, right? That sort of thinking, it just, you never do it, right? None of you ever sit there and think, well, do people really need permission from the government to get married? How critical is permission from the government to getting married? None of you ever think about that. And that's why you're all mentally stunted and that's why you all have the worldview of eight-year-olds and that's why democracy doesn't work because you have a bunch of eight-year-old children making political decisions. All right. Corporations that get corporate bailouts from the government, companies that get government contracts like defense contractors. Why should these people not vote? Well, because it may not be obvious to you, it's really simple. Let's say you work for McDonnell Douglas and you build something. I'm not sure exactly what McDonnell Douglas builds, Let's say they build fighter craft, fighter airplanes. So you build F-16 fighter airplanes. I don't know who builds the F-16. I don't think it's McDonnell Douglas. Just fucking roll with me. If you, if you really care, use Google and figure it out. Let's say that you build F-16 aircrafts. Now, you have two presidential candidates. One says he's going to cut back on military spending and not buy as many F-18s. 
the other presidential candidate says he's going to buy a bunch more F-18s. Now, since your job, your livelihood, your income revolves around building F-18 fighter aircraft, well, gosh, which of those two politicians are you going to vote for? You're going to vote for the one that's going to give you the most money. It's going to be indirect, but he's still giving you money by buying your services. And the purchase of your services is being taken out of the market. This is why you shouldn't be allowed to vote. Now, if your corporation got bailed out by the government, that means your CEO and your board of directors and the people at the upper echelons are doing stupid shit. And the only reason you still have a job is because the government bailed them out. So now, the odds of your CEO and your board of directors and the people in the upper echelons of your company suddenly becoming smarter after they've been bailed out are right about zero. They're not going to become smarter. If anything, they've learned that they can fuck up and the government will come and save them. So again, you have two presidential candidates, or senatorial candidates, or representative candidates, whatever kind of candidates they meet. Who are you going to vote for? Well, you're going to vote for the one who's the most likely to give corporate bailouts the next time your CEO and board of directors and upper echelon idiots fuck up. So again, you're voting yourself more welfare. If we want... We don't want to. We, the royal we, the United States of America, the citizens of this country have no desire to quote-unquote fix anything. But in our thought experiment, if we were trying to create a democracy in which the competent people, the people who actually generate wealth, the people who are competent, who are responsible, where those are the people who vote, then we have to remove from the voting pool anybody who works for a company or a corporation or a business that gets money from the government. You have to do it. Now, having established that people who work for the government are going to vote for whichever political candidate or candidates are going to funnel the most money in their direction, this leaves us looking at one other group of people whom obviously have a vested interest, financially speaking, in who gets elected and how much money is going to be funneled in their direction and therefore have to be removed from the voting pool. This is, in case you haven't figured it out, it should be pretty fucking obvious, this would be government employees. If you work for the government, you shouldn't be voting. It's pretty obvious who you're going to vote for. You're going to vote for whomever is talking about raising taxes to spend money by pumping more money into your department, your division, whatever it is. Again, you're not a responsible, competent adult. The fact that you work for the government means you couldn't find a job in the private sector. The reason you couldn't find a job in the private sector is because you're incompetent. Now, some of you say, well, but great one. You work at theaters and event services also. Don't you sometimes work for the government? Well, yeah, I sure do. And if, if this thought experiment, theoretical democracy in which the voting poll had bleach poured into it, chlorine poured into it, were a reality, I would be more than happy not to vote because I sometimes work for the government. I'd be totally okay with that. I'd be completely fucking okay with it. So that doesn't bother me. It really doesn't fucking bother me. But alas, alas, alas. All of this is merely a thought experiment. Because you know, and I know, and in fact, as I hinted at in the show notes, I don't think I actually talked about this 
anywhere in the podcast itself. I'm, I'm feeling a little slow. I've had two beers. So I'm just like, eh, I just, ah, I'm really relaxed. What was I talking about? Randy's not here to save me. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. As I mentioned this in the show notes, I don't think I actually touched in the podcast. Not only are we never going to see any type of changes to the electoral system in which people that are parasites, because they are government employees, parasites, the definition of parasite is government employee, we're not going to see changes in which parasites are removed from the voting pool. In fact, what we are most likely to see is a system in which poor people and minorities, in order to make up, in order to atone in the form of reparations for all of their <clears throat> subjugation and their the, the discrimination they've had to live with and all this other shit. I can see the day when poor people, illegal aliens, you know, black people, uh, what do you call single mothers, when all of these groups of people will actually be given multiple votes because we will be told that, well, because they're poor, their vote should count for more. So we're going to give each of them two votes, whereas the rich people and the white men who have jobs, they're only going to get one vote. We'll give the homosexuals two votes because they've been oppressed for so long. We'll give the transsexuals, we'll give them three votes because they have so many hurdles to overcome and it's just so difficult to figure out which bathroom to use and, oh, they're so oppressed and, and nobody understands them, right? We'll give the feminists, we'll give them four votes unless they're single mothers, in which case they get five votes. No, actually the single mothers will get two votes but they'll get an additional two votes for each one of their children. And so the day will come when the voting pool, because it hasn't had any chlorine or any bleach added to it, will not only be stagnant, but it will in fact be grown over with algae and all of the fish underneath will be dead and rotting. <laughs> 